and you know what often in 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 scientific inquiry or in 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 scientific analysis or in data analysis we often make a statement concerning a population parameter and under the circumstances if you make a statement concerning a population parameter like the returns on equity stock they hardly exceed 30 percent that is a statement returns on equity stocks they hardly exceed 30 percent in other words the mean return is less than 30 percent there are various discourse that you then have to sponsor from that statement one of them is to test the validity of that hypothesis by using data from random samples which are drawn from that population and we call that hypothesis testing so that is the uh, subject of the next study session or, or next um the subject of the next uh, reading and another thing is if you say you may say let us find what is the optimum or average returns for equity stocks that is called estimation and when you are estimating you can use data from the total population or the population or you can sample it you know that estimation you can make estimates from the sample and then you make what is called the statistical inference in other words a sample statistic is then deemed to be representative of the parameter itself from the population so these are like uh, terminologies used define simple random sampling and a sampling distribution now if they say simple random sampling you know when you are when you are carrying out when you are when you are carrying out a sample what what you do is it is said to be simple random sampling if each element that makes up the sample has an equal chance of being chosen that's simple random sampling a sampling procedure in which you take the subset of the population in such a manner that each element making up the sample is an equal chance of being chosen that's simple random sampling and then the sampling distributions in other words by saying a sampling distribution is when you calculate a statistic let's say you calculate a mean from the sample or standard deviation from the sample and then you take more samples more independent samples from the same population each time we are taking out a sample you are calculating the mean now the distribution of that of the means calculated from that particular sample it is called a sampling distribution so what is a sampling distribution it's simply distribution of the sample statistic from in, in multiple independent random samples taken from the population so it's like suppose you want to take samples of size 30 from uh, s p 500 or samples of size size 100 so you may you may take as many samples as you can in a random way in other words where e where each and every element there is an equal chance of being chosen you may take 30 samples of 100 and on each sample calculating mean so the the means are then distributed in what is called a sampling distribution of means now the ba the basis of us um, uh, conducting a sample is to ensure that we can draw statistical conclusions from the results of the sample concerning the population that's 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 the logic isn't it you can you take a sample with the expectation of drawing conclusions using the results of the sample on the population so it requires that sample to be a representative sample you know the sample used should be a representative sample if we have a situation where the sample used is not representative you draw you make wrong conclusions about the population and we call that sampling error sampling error is where you draw conclusions from a population using sample results which are not representative so it, when when you when you undertake when you want to make conclusions from sample results ensure that those results are the sample itself is representative to mitigate the chance of this issue which we which will refer to as sampling sampling error 
Now, distinguish between simple random and stratified or stratified sampling. There's a simple random sampling, which I have already des described above. It's a sampling procedure where each element making up the sample has an equal chance of being chosen. You know, like the way we choose Lotto from 40, 42 balls, and they will be shuffling them so that every ball there is an equal chance of being chosen. So if you want to calculate sample mean returns from equity stocks, say of Dow, what you simply do is you shuffle, you ensure that all the elements in the Dow, all the firms in the Dow, you have an equal chance of being chosen and you randomly pick 20. And from the 20, you then calculate the, the mean, the average. That becomes statistic. It becomes the mean, which you can say, the returns on the on the Dow stocks you have this particular mean by merely concluding from the results of the sample. Now there's what is called the stratified sampling. Strat to stratify is to classify actually is to group into non-overlapping categories. That's to to stratify. That's to stratify. So if you want to 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 to, to, to carry out suppose you want to to carry out to, to identify returns on equity stocks, but through a methodology of strat stratified sampling, what you would do is you would classify them, say, into small cap, large cap stocks. Suppose you need a sample of 50. So you would classify small cap stocks, large, large cap stocks, and in the small cap, you take 25 at random. In the large cap, you take 25 at random and then you come up with a sample of 50. So that's stratified sampling. It's, it's a procedure where elements in a population are first put into non-overlapping groups, and which are known as strata, stratum for a group, and then random samples are then take, taken from each stratum. You want to select how many people need to attend, to go to a tournament or to you want to select students from a, in a class and you, 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 you don't want to have bias in your selection. What you simply do is you first put girls on them, on, their, on, them, on themselves and boys on themselves and then choose a, a, a given number of girls and a given number of boys at random from these particular strata. That's stratified sampling. You know, all these things, uh, you know, the, you, you may be given a question with two marks for, for, for you know, in, in the actual exam itself, they don't, they don't make it very, very difficult. They don't make it very, very difficult. Oh, sorry. Okay. Wow, these messages. They're saying distinguish between time series and cross-sectional data. You know, often when you are carrying out this sampling, um, you it, it, you have what is called what is called sample possibility space or sample space. You you have what are known as sampling rules, guidelines which you as a research a research analyst you need to follow in constructing your sample. We call these sampling rules. Or well, the each element on a, in a sample is called a sample unit. So what happens is the one of the rules might be use time series data, meaning data which span over a variety of over, over periods. That's time series. So for Suppose we want to, to get time series results for OK Zimbabwe Limited. It would be a matter of getting financial statements, say, for from 2015 to date. The information we get there is called time series data. And then we can have a cross-sectional data. So time series is over a period of time. Cross-sectional data now, it's at a given time, but across companies or across industrial sectors. That's cross-sectional data. So time series data for OK, it's OK Zimbabwe results over a given period of time. That's time series data. 
And then cross-sectional data is data for OK and other companies for a given at a given period. Like what were their performance in 2020? And then we find OK Zimbabwe, pick and pay, and all other retails in the or, or retail. Or we can have cross-sectional data across industries like retail industry, bank industry, hotel, ETC mining. That might be cross-sectional data for a given period of time, just to see how were they affected by this pandemic and stuff, and what were their performance like. So depending on the research topic, it may warrant the nature of data in question, whether you have to go it time series way, or you have to get this data in a cross-sectional fashion. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aspect of the research topic at the end. Except explain the central limit theorem and its importance. Explain the central limit theorem and it's, a, it's important. Now, there is what is called the central limit theorem. So, uh, central limit theorem, we actually call it the distribution of sample mean. Uh, if, 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 if I'm to explain it in simple terms, central limit theorem is like this. It says that if, if, if large samples uh, are taken from a population, with mean mu and variance, with, with mean mu and given variance, then the distribution of the sample mean will have the same mean as that of the population. And let, let me open my Excel here so that some of the things I will be demonstrating with figures. Mm -hmm. Allow it to open shortly. It's opening. Right. So the central limit theorem says like this, you know, for a given distribution, like a random variable X, which say follows, let's say a random variable X follows, do I have follows here? All right. A random variable X follows, uh, let's say normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation of I mean, variance of sigma squared. This is the normal distribution, variance of sigma squared. Now, if you are given this particular variable, it, it, it's a no, it follows a normal distribution with mean mu and a variance Q squared. If you take a lot of symbols, let's say this is S&P 500. S&P 500, their returns have got mean mu and variance Q squared. And now if you suppose you want to take large number of samples from S&P 500, suppose you are just picking 50 stocks and you are repeating those, those samples over and over. And on each sample, you are calculating mean, you are calculating mean, you are calculating mean. So what you then have at the end is called distribution of sample mean. It is called X bar or we, we say distribution of sample mean, meaning x mean. Let me do it like this. Now, the distribution of the means that we're calculating on each sample, according to central limit theorem, it says they will be also normal, but this time with mean mu, they'll be also normal with mean mu and standard and, and variance of q squared. Q squared over N. That's 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 the central limit theorem. That's what it says. 
let me repeat, if large samples of size n are taken from the same population with mean mu and variance q squared, the distribution of the sample mean, meaning on each sample you were calculating mean, on each sample you were calculating mean, so the distribution of those means will also have the same mean with that of the population, but variance, it will be the population variance over n. So if you, if we, if you recall that uh, standard deviation is the square root of variance, it will therefore mean that standard deviation of sample mean, standard deviation of sample mean, sample mean, standard deviation of sample mean, you then calculate it as the square root of variance. So it will be equals to Q over square root of N. Q over square root of N. Uh, if I can just say square root of N. This standard deviation of sample mean, it has got a special name. It is called standard error. In the, in the particular estimation or standard error of the sample mean. It is not referred to as a standard deviation, but it's called the standard error of the sample mean. So no wonder why they then say, uh, I, I, had to, I had to open this because the handout says, explain the central limit and its importance. So let, uh, let me finish the central limit and its importance. Now, what are the, so what is central limit you now know? If random samples are taken from a population with mean mu and variance q squared, therefore the distribution of sample means will also have the same mean as the population and the variance will be variance of the population over sample size, that is over n, n is the sample size. Now the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means is called the standard error in our estimation or the standard error of the sample mean, so to speak. Now, what is the importance of central limit theorem? It, it means you as, a, as an investor, if you are carrying out a research from a population with a known mean or a known average, you need to, to, to not to bother yourself what is the likely mean that you are going to get from your sample. If, if you carry out, you perform large samples on each sample computing the mean, you do notice that the means are distributed in the same way as the population mean, population parameter. So, so it, it then causes you to negate whatever the distribution is. You know, there are various probability distributions. There is what is called binomial distribution, which we discussed last week. You do notice if, if, you carry out large samples from a binomially distributed or binomially experiment and you come up with large samples, still the distribution of sample means will still have normal distribution with mean mu, which is the population mean and the, stand and the variance as indicated. So central limit theorem then, it doesn't only say you take samples from a, norm, from a normally distributed population. No, from any distributed a population, be it log normal, be it binomially distributed, provided you are carrying out those samples from those populations. The central limit theorem says the distribution of sample means, meaning the averages you'll be getting on each sample, if you want to find their distribution, it will be normal. Whether it was from a non-normal distribution, distribution of a sample mean will be normal with mean q, with mean mu and standard deviation of q squared over n. So it's, it's a very important research conclusion. And you, as you shall notice, the central limit theorem helps us now to estimate, we, we are going to come to estimation shortly. Calculate in, and, and interpret the standard error of the sample mean. You now understand what the standard error of, uh, of the sample mean is. The standard error of the sample mean, it, it, it comes from this central limit theorem, which says the variance will be Q squared over N. So standard deviation is the square root of variance of the sample mean. And we don't call it a standard deviation per se. We, I said we call it standard error of the sample mean. It is called standard error of the sample mean. That's proper terminology for, 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 the, vari for the standard deviation 
which is from distribution of sample means. We call it the standard error of the sample mean. So when they are saying calculate and interpret, it's a matter of saying square root of variance. So square root of Q squared is Q. Square root of N is N, so it's Q over square root of N. That's how you get standard error of the sample mean. Okay, then another is identify and describe a desi des desirable properties of an estimator. Now, we need to understand what, what an estimator is before we even come up to desirable properties of an estimator. You know, concerning sample and population, we, we do have what is called sample and we do have what is called population. You know, this is what they normally ask in USM. There's population and there's a sample. Here we mean 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 equals x bar. X, uh, I, I can't put x bar, I can't put statistical notations. But here we have got sample mean, and here sample mean is called mu. So we are saying a sample mean, a sample mean will estimate a population mean. You get that? A sample mean will, popu will estimate a population mean. And a sample variance, sample variance will estimate, will actually estimate population variance. That's, that's the understanding there. Population, population variance. That's, that's the understanding. And, and, and normally this understanding are like this. From a sample here, we call these statistics. These are called statistics. From a population, we call these parameter. Parameter. So we do have a sample statistic, which estimates a population parameter. So what are population parameters? Mu and and spot and variance. So normally we take the results of the sample to estimate or to draw conclusions about the population. So the sample that you make sure you are using, make sure that sample is a representative sample. I said it in the introductory maths. Make sure that is a rep representative sample. And how you make sure it's a representative sample, you make it a simple random sampling make it take yeah compile it in such a way that each element in there is an equal chance of being chosen is an equal chance of being chosen now in our previous discussion we discussed how we estimate mean we simply said mean equals sum of observations in a sample divided by n standard deviation remember standard deviation we said sum of if, if it's variance Sample variance, remember we said it's calculated as sum of, and then we said x minus mean, like this, squared. Then you divide all this by n minus 1. n minus 1, that is if it's a sample variance. Sum of x minus mean squared and then you divide all that by n minus 1. If it's a population, you divide by n. You still remember. So we, so we are saying this, this formula will approximate to a population variance. And mean we, mean, we simply said sum of x over n will approximate to a population mean. So what are the desirable characteristics? Now that, that is now the, the reading, the, 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 the LOS. It's saying what characteristics do you expect to find before you use a statistic to say it estimates a parameter? There, there is unbiasedness. Now, characteristics of estimators. Characteristics of estimators. Estimators. Uh, you know, there are various characteristics of estimators, but they border around the most, the most common one is unbiasedness. Unbiasedness. No, you know, 
we, we call an estimator is unbiased if it equals to the um, parameter that it's estimating. That's what, what unbiasedness means. We are simply saying the estimator equals to the parameter that it is estimating. That's unbiasedness. If it doesn't, then it's not unbiased. It's, it's, not, it's not biased. I mean, it becomes biased. All right, then there's another desirable characteristics which is called efficiency. Efficiency. You know, efficiency of, of an estimator is simply means, uh, take for example, a, a variance. It means as you perform more experiments or as you take more samples, there should be no possibility or minimum possibility of getting a variance which is lower than what you have get, what you have obtained. If there's a possibility of getting a variance which is lower than what you have obtained, we say the estimation, your estimator is not efficient. It's not efficient. And do you know of any other characteristic? It starts with a C. Consistent. Consistency, good. What does that mean? I don't have the words. I know what consistency means, but then I don't have the words to describe the words. Right. Consistency. Consistency means, you know, the probability, actually, consistency means as you increase the sample size, it is highly likely that you converge towards the population parameter. That's consistency. If you are to increase this, no, you, you suppose you are having a sample size of 20 and the mean, the, the variance was we know that the population variance, for example, suppose we know that the population variance is 36. With a sample size of 20, you are getting 34, 35 comma. But it is a, a parameter is consistent it, 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 if it is of such nature that as you are increasing the sample size, you are narrowing the gap towards the getting the exact population parameter. That's consistent. Otherwise, if if you are increasing sample size and you are diverging away from the population parameter, it means that statistic <laughs> is not consistent. It's like we, we want, uh, we want to, to widen the chance of getting something. Suppose you are playing Lotto and you are saying, if I just pick seven numbers, I am far away from the mark. Now, can you consider a situation where you conclude and say, let me increase the numbers? Um, this time you are now increasing the numbers to, to from seven. Let's say you are now increasing them to, to fourteen. We expect you to narrow the gap of actually being or, or of actually getting getting the the the, the up, uh, if if it's a if a jackpot getting the jackpot in question. You get that. So what is consistent? It's, we are simply saying the chance or the probability of this statistic being equal to the parameter increases as the sample size increases. That's consistency. Then uh, if efficiency, we are talking of us having no other variable apart from what we have got containing the population parameter. If there's a chance that another unbiased estimate exists, it means that a particular estimator or statistic is not efficient. Then unbiasedness looks at the extent to which that particular est statistic equals to the parameter that it is estimating. You get that? And you know what? When, when you are calculating these, like, like, like mean, mu, and stuff, I mean, mean pop, uh, sample variance and stuff, we call these point estimates. They are called point estimates because 
We conduct a sample and calculate them from a sample. So they are called point estimators because they are single digits. They are single digits, meaning point estimators. If we say mean is 20, it's the, same, it's the point, so it's 20. But, you know, it's, it's, it's risky in a statistical analysis to have a single value as the estimate. Because clearly, if you take say, returns from S&P 500 and you just have a sample of 100 stocks, out of 500, you have a sample of 100, and then you conclude about S&P 500, there's a by a point estimate, just from the sample, you come up with 36% as the return, and then you say all the stocks in S&P, we can estimate that all, meaning population, their return is 36. There's a chance that that return that we have got might not be efficient. Efficient meaning, should we take another sample, we are in danger of getting another result. So it, it means it's not efficient. So how do we mitigate that? We, we come up with what is called interval estimates. We, that's how we, in the estimates are single digits, which might not actually represent the population parameter. So in mitigation, we come up with what we call interval estimate. Some call it confidence intervals. Oh, let me go on with <laughs> I have ignored my LOSs. You know, going by LOS enables me not to not to skip anything. We do have what is called interval estimate. Now you understand what the reason for interval estimate is to mitigate shortfalls or shortcomings associated with point estimates. Interval estimate now creates, it's a random interval created from, uh, from it's, it's a random interval which you create as an analyst, which you believe with a given probability that it includes the population parameter. So instead of saying mean is 36, interval estimate can say the interval which includes the mean is from 28 to 42. You have created an interval estimate and the 28 is called the lower end of the interval and 42 is the upper end of the interval. The width of the interval it, it's affected by what is called the reliability factor or the confidence that you have. So we can have a 25 and a 90% confidence interval. A, you can have a 95% confidence interval. You may have a 99% confidence interval. As you increase the percentage, you increase the width of the interval. As you reduce the percentage, you narrow the width of the interval. So in, in, your, in, 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 your quest, in, in your exams, you'll be asked, you may be given just a question saying, what will be the lower end of the interval? So basically, how do we calculate confidence interval? Uh, as I'm saying, it's, it's a given percentage confidence interval. So you'll be given a percentage. Percentage confidence interval. You, for, for a population mean, you simply say equals. You say the mean that you have. Normally, it, it will be about the mean. And then you say plus or minus. Because you need the low, the upper and the lower, so it's plus or minus reliability factor. Reliability factor. This is determined by the percentage that you have. Reliability factor multiplied by the standard error of standard error of the sample mean. Standard error of the sample mean. Sample mean. It, 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 that's how you calculate a, a, that's how you calculate the reliability, the, the confidence interval. Now, as I have said, we make use of tables in our, in our, in our, in our, in our exam. We make use of tables, but the, the tables are not provided. So the examiner will give you the reliability factors where appropriate. But conditions holds. There are various conditions for you to, to reliability factors are obtained from tables. Let me first have that point. It say reliability factors are 
obtained from tables, tables at a given level of confidence, given level of, of actually we, it's a given level of probability. Let's say probability. Okay. That's how you get reliability factors. You obtain them from tables at a given level of probability. So you, you'll be given probability, probability, and then here we have got confidence, confidence, and then here we have got reliability factor. A reliability factor reliability factor so it depends it, it it just depends on what are we talking about like suppose these are z tables z tables if we say probability is 10% 10% percent like this it means we are talking of 90 percent confidence level and reliability factor you get it by saying 10 percent over two from tables because why over two it's because the the, the confidence level has got upper end and lower end so you need both ends of the confidence table no wonder why we divide the probability by two in, in the tables, it is denoted as alpha. You get that? So if you if we want 95% confidence interval, you, you, are, you are saying uh, if, 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 if probability is 5%, what we are looking for is 95% confidence interval. And then from reliability factors from tables, you look up for them at 5% over 2, over 2 from tables. Uh, if, 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 if we can have tables to show you what I'm talking about, mm, if we can have tables, just, oh, sorry, the tables are somewhere here. Tables. notice i just want to show you how you'll be given the table the, these figures in the tables okay i'll come to that let me put that's 90 95 and if we may put 91 percent it means you need to construct a 99 percent confidence interval Reliability factor, it will be 1% over 2 from tables. Now let us, you, let us try to find the reliability factors from this. You know, when you, are, when you are saying standard error of the sample mean, you now understand how it is calculated. It's simply saying variance over n. It's squared. It's, it's, it's squared it's, it's of variance over n. Right. So... Let's say we want to find the reliability factor for 10%. We say 10% over 2, you get 5%. So if I come to the table, here, the, the region to the right of Z must just be 5%. Because I, I need an interval left and right so that outside is just 5%. Outside is just 5%. So it means to the left of Z, I need 95%. And 95% is the probabilities in the table. So it's a matter of getting to 95 in the table. You get 95. 90, 94, 95, 90. It's 1,64. Yeah, 1,65. It I would I would appreciate if you take the lower end. 1,64. That's where you get 95. This one. 95. Or this one, which whichever figure you pick here, it's a good estimate. 
because they they are both close to 95. So they are so if we if we pick 95,05, it will be under 1,6 under 5. So the reliability factor will be 1,65 here. 1,65. Let me let me repeat by another one. 97 percent. 95% confidence interval. If we want 95% confidence interval, probability, we say alpha over 2, which is 2,5. So 2,5 is the probability which is on the outside here. It should be 2,5 to the, to the right because we want to create an interval. 2,5 to the right, 2,5 to the left. So for you to have 2,5 to the right of Z, Area to the left of Z should be 97,5. So we just search for 97,5 from the table. And you have it here. 97,5. Ah, uh, it's uh, 2,5. It will be 9. Yes, 9,75. For you to get 2,5. Good. So it will be 1,9. 1,9 under... 1,9 and uh, 6. So it will be 1,96. That will be the reliability factor. 1,96 here. Again, on 1%, you do the same. You say 1% divide by 2. You get 0,5%. So area to the right of Z should be 0,05%, meaning to the left, 99,5%. So you're looking at 995. So that's how you get reliability factors. 995. You can pick it. 995, 995, 995. A number, a number which is close to 995. This is 9953, 9955, 99. Oh, we are actually moving away from 995. So it's either 99, 9952 and 9953 and 9951 this one 9951 i'm sure it's close so you are looking at 2.58 that would be the reliability factor 2.5 under 8 so in the exam you'll be given these reliability factors so it's not an issue it's not an issue then these are the rules listen to the rules I, I just wanted to explain what reliability factors are. And now here are the rules. Rules for these are rules for constructing confidence intervals. Constructing confidence intervals. When you are constructing interval estimates, uh, co co confidence intervals, you follow these rules to the letter. In in most instances, you follow these rules to the letter because they guide us what to use. And normally you may be asked questions on the rules itself, not even on the on the need to construct one, but on the rules itself. For example, if, if sample size, if sample is small, meaning small by small, we mean less than 30, and variance, and variance uh, and variance is known is known then we use we use z dis, z distribution by saying we use z distribution we are saying we use z tables the ones i was i was using above there those are called the z distribution tables uh, if sample size by sample size if sample is large if sample is large by large we mean greater than or equal to greater than or equal to 30 if you take a sample which is uh, of size greater than or equal to, to 30 this is sample size and variance is unknown by variance we are saying population variance and population Variance is unknown. What do we do? Use Z distribution again. 
It is because of central limit theorem. These are now the uses of the central limit theorem that we are talking about. Now, lastly, if if sample size if sample size is small and population variance is unknown, population variance, population variance is unknown, unknown, uh, comma, we use T, T distribution tables. Actually, T distribution is a more accurate table than Z. Z is Z, Z distribution, T distribution, distribution tables. Table. What do we use tables for? We use tables to get reliability factors. And in your exam, you'll be given. You may be given table extract from T and extract from, from Z. Now, for T distribution, for T distribution, degrees of freedom, we use what is called degrees of freedom for T distribution. And degrees of freedom for T distribution, degrees is of freedom from for T distribution is n minus 1. n minus 1. That's degrees of freedom. E.g. E.g. Let me put here sample size. Sample size. And then uh, degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom, we call that DF, degrees of freedom, and then, um, then here I copy as it is, copy and put it here. I want I want you to, to notice how we then get reliability factors from a T distribution. This is now from a T distribution. Reliability factors, they cease to be these ones. They cease. They now change. Now notice. Let's say sample size is 22. You take you you sample 22 stocks. Sample size is 16, and sample size is 100. I want you to find how T distribution works. Now, degrees of freedom here will be 21. Here will be 15 n minus 1. That's degrees of freedom, and here will be 99. And now, probabilities. So what you do, you come to the T distribution table. Student T, you we will be given the T distribution tables. Here you are. Notice the 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 the, the, the T distribution tables have got degrees of freedom, and the probabilities. So if you want a reliability factor for 10% confidence interval, I said you say 10% over two. That's five percent. So here you are, you are coming to degrees of freedom, 21 under 5% to get the reliability factor. So it will be 21 on degrees of freedom and across year 5, 0,05. That's 5%. So 21 under the second column, you get 1,72. So that will be the reliability factor, 1,72 here. 1,72. Notice under under Z it was 1,65, under T it's 1,72. It changes. Then if you want six degrees of freedom, 15 probability was five, so alpha over two becomes 2,5, meaning 0, 0,025. You come to 15, and uh, your probability at the top is 0, 0,025, which is this one. And 15 on your left to the third column. 15 on your left under third column. Here. So you get 2,113 as your reliability factor here. 2,13. Notice here it was 1,96. Now it's 
And last but not least, if if simple if 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 uh, that that one was was ninety percent, which is zero comma zero 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 five. So on top here we are looking for zero comma zero 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 five, meaning zero comma zero 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 five, which is this one. Uh, which is the fourth column from left, and then 99 is your degrees of freedom. You check here, there's no 99 here. Rather, there's a six and there's 120. So what is close to 99 is 120. You come to 120 and pick the figure here, 2,62. You just take the nearest. You don't, you don't, you don't look for 99. You won't find it. So that's 2, comma what? Uh, 2,62 as your reliability factor. I just wanted so if so you these are the th the figures you only need to calculate confidence intervals because it's it's mean plus or minus reliability factor. So these are the guidelines for the reliability factor. These ones you now have the guidelines whether whether you go to for t tables or you go for z tables. And then, so it's mean plus or minus reliability factor times the standard error of the sample mean, where standard error of the sample mean, we can only, we can, we can get it from the standard error of the sample mean, we get it from the information given. We don't get it from tables. Describe the properties of a T distribution and calculate and interpret its degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom is simply the degrees of freedom. It's, it's you as a researcher the number of ways you can come up with a sample with samples so if 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 suppose you are given things 1 to 10 and you are selecting samples of 10 you do notice you can only do that 9 times you are given 1 to 10 and you are asked to select samples of 10 how many times can you do that you can only do that 9 times so that becomes your degrees of freedom you are, you are to collect samples of 10 from numbers 1 to 9 and you are, from numbers 1 to 10 and you are given 10. You can only do that nine times. Those are your degrees of freedom. We don't necessarily ask you what does degrees of freedom mean because that is a statistical term. But rather at your level, we focus more on are you able to inter to use it in, in, in calculating. So there is T distribution as we have noticed. If you if you check the characteristic of a T distribution and Z distribution, it's almost the same. It's almost the same. Only that uh, as the sample size gets small, it is po the, the 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 numerically correct table to use is the Z is the T distribution. Calculate and interpret confidence interval of a population mean with normal standard distribution with normal distribution known population variance, unknown population variance, and known population variance where the sample size is large. We shall do this shortly when you are working questions. This is what I have not denoted here with red. The figures which are shown in red here, these figures, which are given in red here, are the figures which we shall use. This where I'm saying use Z, use Z, use T, I'm saying reliability factors, get them from Z tables, get them from T tables. Get, reliability factors are obtained from tables, I told you, at a given level of probability. So depending on whether the population size is known or the population size is, is small, is large, etc., they, it, it then gives, gives us a clue on which table to use. So... I have put this here so that when, when we when you are doing questions, it will be a quick. Um, now there are quite a lot of sampling uh, sampling biases. Sampling biases. Uh, you know, sampling biases actual ah, okay. Oh, so that's great. That was quick, isn't it? We are almost done with LOSs. Sampling biases, they are now, you know, these are you know, this is a this is a book for 2019, but notice this was written 2014. Actually, very few have changed. What have changed? What and what I have noticed from the change is the issue of risk management. You know, COVID has brought another discourse. You show you, but, uh, only that you are doing a, a level one. Level one is more theory, but level two 
governance and the risk management is now involving because of the dichotomies, the nature of risky profiles which are facing organizations, and even the weights have changed. The weights on level two are if, the weights on, on the topic on the risk management, like portfolio theory and the risk management. It is now more weight because uh, it was realized that most corporations were caught off guard with this pandemic from supply chain up through to business models. They couldn't cope with the rapid change in the environment. So amongst the, amongst the company fundamental analysis is its mechanisms in place to identify profile, manage and mitigate risks that it is facing. Uh, so the, 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 they really change. So if you have got papers, say from 2015, 20, you can still do those papers. It's still fine. Do those uh, mocks. Still fine, especially on quantitative methods. Nothing has changed. Describe the issues regarding selection of appropriate sample, like data mining bias. Data mining bias simply means it's a bias which is associated with restricting your analysis to the set of data set that you are using. We call that data mining bias, where you, where you continue to carry out sample from a data which might not be suitable for extrapolation. It's like the data was, set, was gathered with a particular objective in mind. Suppose we gather data, we want to see how many firms have, va have vaccinated their employees with COVID. That is the objective of gathering data. The, that was the objective. And now you, you, you begin to carry out large samples for other discourse, for other research topics, which has nothing to do with the original intention upon which data was, uh, was obtained. Then sample selection bias. Sample selection bias is an issue of the manner in which we are selecting samples. You know, others select samples based on the availability of data uh, or convenience to the researcher to select that particular sample. That sample selection bias, meaning the, sam the, the, the sampling rules, they favor a particular item to be selected rather than having a sample which is, which is simple, random. Survivorship bias normally looks at Selecting samples from firms which are in existence, we call those survivorship biases. Where, where you know, like you want to know how firms are doing uh, during this COVID issue, and you just select use data from samples which are in existence. That is called survivorship bias. Because there is other information which we may not behave from firms which are no longer existing. You you just have bias towards those who are Then look ahead bias is when when sample results are based on what the what what when the when the data is based on something which is which is futuristic, not 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 historical. Time period bias, as the name suggests, it's where you are having a sample. And the, the data in question is suitable for a particular period, and you cannot draw conclusions about any other period apart from that. We call that time period bias. So all these biases, as a researcher, you need to have them. They are important to make sure that the they are important to make sure that the the the, the sample is unbiased. Like time period bias, you are simply saying, suppose the results were time specific, and then you draw conclusions from a sample or from a, on a population using the results which were merely time specific. That's time period bias. You need to understand that, or period specific. Look ahead bias is where you know the information you are using. It's, it's, you, 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 are, you, are, you are drawing conclusions about future using information which is not necessarily available. You know, there are, there are, there are instances when information about the future is not, is not, is not available. That's look ahead bias. And then you use information to extrapolate, yet the information about that particular future was not available. Uh, you know, as we have said, Last time I, 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 could, I could just have these 
then say do questions i need to change now because of time i need to change that approach if 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 we can and do some few questions about 10 of them i'm sure 10 will take us somewhere uh, all right 10 uh, now we we want to start from number uh, number one actually the the intention my intention was once i say let us do this i wanted us to cover i i, I would want what i would want you to cover all questions prior uh, be prior to the next lecture so they are not much they are really not much they are in the region of 30 25 30 they don't exceed 30 in most instances peter briggs wants to know how growth managers performed last year big sorry Biggs assumes that the population cross-sectional standard deviation of the growth, uh, growth manager returns is 6% and that returns are independent across managers. Right? Then, how large a random sample does Biggs need if he wants a standard deviation of the sample to be 1%? How large the sample does he have if he needs the standard deviation of sample means to be 1%? You know, wh when we say standard deviation of sample means, like a question like this one, standard deviation of sample means to be 1%, this is the standard error of the estimate. That's what, that's what, that's what it means when they're saying standard deviation of the sample mean is the standard error of the estimate and in our in our workings here how how did we say we calculate it we said we simply say if you are calculating standard error of the estimate you simply say variance over square root of n variance over square root of n right variance over square root of n and this should give you one variance over square root of n this should give you one or oh, so it's like this not variance over square root of n so we do have standard it's a standard deviation over square root of n should give you one these are exam questions standard deviation which is q over square root of n should give you one so it's a matter of saying one percent equals uh yeah 1%, it's, it's, a, it's actually an equation. One per, they are saying standard error of the estimate must be 1. So 1% 1 equals 6 divided by square root of n. Square root of n. And what, what, what becomes, what your n becomes, it's 1 equals 6 divided by square root of n. So we are now saying square root of n equals 1. Basic maths square root of n equals 1 and i mean is square root of n equals 6 so so what is your n, mm, n i got oh sorry square root of n equals 6 n is 36 right yes yes so the square root of 36 that's your n so that will be your answer He's saying how large the sample size should be such that uh, the standard error of the estimate equals one. So what you have to come is, how do we calculate standard error of the estimate? It's a standard deviation over square root of n. They are saying this should be one. Now in the question, we are given the standard deviation here. We are given the standard deviation to be uh, 6% over square root of n. And as I saying, how large a random sample does bigs need if he wants the standard deviation of the sample means, standard deviation of the sample means, that is called the standard error of the estimate to be 0 0.25. So it's, a, it's again the, the same, you, 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 you follow the same procedure. You now say 0 0.25 equals 6 over square root of n, and still you, you get the answer again in the same procedure. Now question number two says, Petra Munz wants to know how value managers performed last year. 
Moons estimates that the population cross section or standard deviation uh, value of manager returns is 4%. That's the standard error of the estimate. Uh, 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 this is now pop it's population, not from the sample. And assumes that the returns are independent across managers. Moons wants to build a 95% confidence interval for the mean return. How large a random sample does if Moons need uh, does Moons need if she wants the 95% confidence interval to have a total width of one. Con 95, she, she needs the difference between upper limit and lower limit to have a total width of one. 95% confidence interval. Now, are you not seeing something? Here, yeah, the population variance is known. Here yeah, the population variance is known because we are we are we are told that the population standard deviation is two percent, so the population variance is known. And and if the population variance is known, it means you come here and we say that would we calculate ninety five percent confidence interval. Now ninety five percent confidence interval. You say mean plus or minus reliability factor times the standard error of the estimate. So here, let me put it like this. Let me bring the formula back. Okay, here's the formula. This is the formula for calculating 90% confidence interval. Now the error, the, this population variance is known. So we use Z distribution and 95% reliability factor is 1,96. So we are saying mean plus or minus 1,96. So this is what I would want you to be doing after each and every lecture. 1,96 times standard error of the estimate. You remember standard error of the estimate in this case, standard error of the estimate. Uh, we, are, we are told that it's 4%, that's standard deviation over square root of n. So it's times 4 over uh, square root of n. n is what we are looking for. Notice this part here, this part here, which, which I have shaded in red, it gives us the width of the interval. That part here, 1,96 1, times 4 over square root of n, it gives us the width of the interval. Because it is that figure which is plus or minus d plus or minus. So it's like this. Notice, if I say 45, no, I want to take it from figures that you know. If I say 40, plus or minus, plus or minus 5, like this, 40 plus or minus 5, are you not seeing here that it becomes 35, to 45. If someone is saying 35 to 45, and someone who is saying 40 plus or minus 5, someone is saying 40 plus or minus 5, and one is saying 35 to 45, are you not saying you are telling me the same thing? 40 plus or minus 5, and one is saying 35 to 45. So you can see here that the width is 10. The width of this interval is 10. But are you not seeing that 10 can be obtained by just multiplying 5, this 5 by 2? If we multiply this 5 by 2, we get 10. This is what I'm saying when I'm saying this in red here helps us to find the width of the interval. So in this particular question, the examiner then says they want the width of of the interval to be one, to be one. So it's it's not a trans mark. So you can simply say two, two times one comma nine six times uh, times four over square root of n, meaning n to the power zero comma five. This should give you one. The width they need the width to be one. 
So you can now solve this equation. You you can solve it using uh, that was one comma nine six, not one slash nine six, one comma nine six. So you can solve it by where's my calculator? Okay, I have it here. It's two times one comma nine six times four. What do I get? I get fifteen comma six eight. So it is now fifteen comma six eight over n to the power of zero comma five equals one equals one so this becomes my actual equation uh, so i can now say multiply throughout it, it becomes n to the power of 0 comma 5 equals 16 15 comma 6 8 and what is n it's a matter of saying square 15 over 15 comma 6 8 squared so n equals 15 comma 6 8 squared this figure here squared. Um, so how many stocks? I'm getting 245. Uh, so 245 stocks should be should be should be should be undertaken. In total, it becomes 246 because you can't. It's 245 comma 86. So your n equals 246. You know what? If if you if you if you consider it nicely, like the way I I I I put it, like. If I say 40 plus or minus 5, and the person who is saying 35 to 40, the width is 10 of this interval. And you can get 10 by merely multiplying this 5 here by 2. This is what we have done. One, this uh, to the right gives you the width if it is multiplied by 2. Simple as that. Right. So I'm sure then Moons expect a cost of about ten dollars to collect each observation. If she has one thousand budget, uh, one thousand dollar budget, will she be able to construct confidence interval she wants? If she if she does have one thousand dollar budget, because you know the sample notice, the sample is she need to collect how I many two forty six, and we are told here that. She needs uh, to collect. She needs it costs her ten dollars to to collect each observation. And we are we are told we we have calculated the number of observations and we found them to be two forty six. And each observation is ten dollars. So in other words, the ten dollars times two forty six, which is uh, two thousand four hundred and sixty. So clearly, she won't be able to 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 do that with a budget of hundred, isn't it? She won't be able to do it. So how then? How then? How then does she need to to make sure that she does it? Because the the one thousand at a cost of ten. One thousand dollar budget at a cost of ten. It means this budget is only enough for hundred. And I don't think she she will be able to. She 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 won't be able to cover two forty six because they are saying will she be able to construct the confidence interval she wants? Now how how can she construct the confidence interval she wants? I told you, she can only construct the confidence interval she wants if she reduces the confidence level to narrow the to narrow the the, the gap. But she has to raise the budget to 2,460. So in this case, with, with this budget, she won't be able to get a 95% confidence interval with a width of one. She won't be able to get that. Right? Uh, assume the equity risk premium is normally distributed with a population mean of six and a population standard deviation of 18. Over the last four years, equity returns over the last four years, equity returns relative to, to the risk-free have averaged minus 2%. You have, a, you have a large client who is very upset and claims that the that, resu that results this poor should never okay. Evaluate your client's concerns by constructing a 95% confidence interval around the population mean for the sample of four year returns. So the sample is four. Sample size is four. Population variance is known. 
when they say population standard deviation, they actually tell you that population variance is known. So confidence interval, 95% confidence interval. Again, the reliability factor is 1,6. So it will be, it will be like, it will be like, um, you calculate confidence interval by saying mean plus or minus. So it will be six plus or minus. Standard deviation is 18 over square root of four, which is two. 18 over square root of four, which is two. So it will be 18 over square root of square root of uh, of four year tens, which is square root of two, which is which is which, where, that that gives you two. And then she's saying, if average to minus two percent, you are very upset. Okay. So there you go. Now. What, what then becomes the, the confidence interval that we have to, to, to construct? 6 plus or minus, so it becomes 6 minus 9. So it becomes 6 minus 9. That's the confidence interval. You can, you can put it in bracket 6 minus 9 like this. S2, 6 plus 9. Nine because it's six plus or minus so six minus nine s to six plus nine and then the interval that we get is from minus three to fifteen oh sorry minus three okay minus three to fifteen you can get that so the manager is upset that the returns were minus two. Then evaluate your client's concerns. Actually, if 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 the if the manager is upset that returns were minus two, and the confidence interval that we have constructed is saying minus three to fifteen, is the manage are the manager's concerns accurate or they are misplaced? Oh, is it minus? Talk to me. Okay, I said, sorry, I said six plus or minus. I forgot to put a liability factor. It's a liability factor 1,96 times 18 over 2. It was supposed to be like this. So six. Uh, it's 1,96 times 18 over 2. It's 17,64. So it is 17,64. So it's like 6 minus 17,64. What do you get? It, 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 so it's, it's ranging from minus 11,64. Minus 11, comma. Oh, sorry. Let me say. Minus eleven comma six four two uh, plus six seventeen comma six four plus six. It's ranging to twenty three comma six four. Now my question was: managers contain valid or not valid? Because the average return over the past four years was minus two. I think they're valid. Ah, not notice, notice, uh, Munash. The manager is saying, after you as an analyst, you collected returns and you find that they were averaging minus two percent. And then, the manager said, such returns are very poor and they should never okay. This is your average. It's minus two percent over the four-year period. But if you construct a 90% confidence interval, are you not seeing that minus 2% is included in the interval? Yes. Okay. So, so, so if, if, suppose I come to you and say, how much does this port cost? 
You say this pot costs, I, I, I buy a, a pot for $30. For $30. And then I say, mm, this price is very expensive. And then I say, can you construct a 95% confidence interval for the price of pots? And you come up with a price with an interval which is ranging from 22 to 48. But I bought it at 30. And then I say, the 30 is expensive and must never okay. Yet it is within the interval. So you do notice that my complaint there is not valid. Because the minus 2% that the fund generated is within the, conf the interval which accommodates the population mean. You get that? Yes, now I get it. Yes. And then, what is the probability of a minus 2% or lower average return over the four-year period? What is the probability of minus 2%? Now, if you, if, if you are asked this, actually, these are some of the basic exam questions. Mean is 6 so it's like I told you when you are using normal distribution. So X follows the returns. If we say the returns is X, we say they follow normal distribution with mean 6 and standard deviation of 18. 18 squared. 18 squared. This is the distribution. 6 with a standard deviation. And now you are asked what is the probability that the question is what is the probability that a, a, a minus two percent or lower average return over a four period so you are now saying p so simple mean x now x simple mean because what we, we have taken four year period so it's a simple mean it, it according to central limit theorem the simple mean will still have same mean as the population, but the variance becomes 18 squared over 4. The variance becomes 18 squared over 4. That's the distribution of simple mean. And the question then is, what is the probability that simple mean will be, will be 2 minus 2 or lower? So we are now calculating P. No, sorry. Uh, P sample mean, meaning X mean, sample mean, less than, because they are saying minus 2 or lower, less than minus 2. Remember what we said we do? We standardize. When we are using normal distribution, we standardize. We say, we say equals. Uh, minus 2, minus 6, minus 2, minus 6. This is called the standardization. Remember, by standardization, you say x minus mu. Minus 2, minus 6 over 18 divided by 2. Because if we find the standard deviation of this figure here, 18 squared over 2, if you find the square root of this, it becomes 18 over 2. So we are say, we are now saying this is P Z. It's now Z because it is now standardized. Z less than Z less than what do you get? Minus eight over nine. Eight over nine. It's zero comma eight nine. Z less than minus zero comma eight nine. Now, if you want to find Z less than minus 0, 0,89, you come to the tables. We need the probability of this. So you come to Z tables. This, this is called to the left of Z. These probabilities that you are, you, are, you are getting here are probabilities to the left of Z. To the left of Z. Because the shaded region is the, is the region we are looking for. And there are probabilities to the left because you are told here, but Z less than. So probabilities to the left of Z, we need 0, 0,89, 0, 0,8 under 9, which is 18, 0, 0,167. That becomes your answer. 0, 0,1867. Sorry. Hello? 
Yes, how are you? Oh, exam fees or tuition fee? Or tuition fees? Which ones really are you inquiring? Exam fees. Ah, no, exam fees we are, are not charged by the college, but they are obtainable per ACA website. Okay, what about the tuition fee? Tuition fee is $20 per month per, sub, um, per subject. Two and a half months. So you'll be writing in September. We start the lectures for September in, on, in the, on the first week of June. So call us around the first week of June. We only take two and a half months to complete the syllabus. And I'm in a lecture at the moment, so you can send me a WhatsApp message and then I'll forward everything that you need. Yes, on this number. Okay, so so you get the answer. The answer becomes 1,867. Have you noticed? I need to, to take you back to last week's lecture. Last week's lecture, it says, when you are performing probabilities from a normal distribution like this, this is the normal distribution. You standardize. To standardize is to say x minus mu, x minus mu like this, over standard deviation. Now, if the variance is 18 squared over 4, meaning standard deviation is the square root of all this, so square root of 18 squared is 18, square root of 4 is 2. So that's how we standardize. The moment you standardize, it ceases, it ceases to be x, it becomes z. The moment it is standardized, it is, it is now referred to a z. It ceases to be x. Don't worry, we shall come across questions of this nature. So this, this answer, you can give it as a percentage. It might be 18,67% or just 0 0,1867. Compare the standard normal distribution and the t distribution. Now, if you want to compare the standard normal distribution and the t distribution, such questions are not exam questions. But it's important for you to notice why t and why normal. Let me scroll back. Uh, t, I said, is a more accurate measure in terms of determining the reliability factors. T is more accurate than, than standard normal distribution. So this is this this is the standard normal distribution. The one in bold here. Is the standard normal distribution and the dotted and the faint one is the t distribution. So are you, you if you if you if you notice both are symmetrical about the mean, whether it's t distribution or it's no it's 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 normal distribution, they are both symmetrical about the mean. That's first point. Another point is as the degrees of freedom, you know. The lower the degrees of freedom, the, the, the flatter the T distribution. Notice T distribution becomes relatively flatter when degrees of freedom are lower than when degrees of freedom are higher. Are you not seeing if degrees of freedom is 8, which is evidenced by the dotted line, the higher the degrees of freedom, the more the t distribution approximates to the normal distribution. But with the lower degrees of freedom, the t distribution is not approximate to the, uh, to the normal distribution. No wonder why we say if n is large, meaning greater than or equal to 30, we use z distribution. The understanding was, as the sample size becomes large, degrees of freedom they increase. As we increase the degrees of freedom, the T distribution approximates to the normal distribution. You get that? You know, I also I would say that you're right. Let me 
skip all these and get to, if we can get to multiple choice questions, if we have any. Because all these questions are now provide 95% confidence in, let me see. Uh, oh. Okay, we were on which, let, uh, let, us, let us proceed in. Find the reliability factors based on a T distribution and confidence intervals with degrees of freedom. So oh, this part where we, we find the reliability factors, we have done it in the course of our explanation. Remember, if they say 90% confidence interval, like if they say 90% confidence interval, they mean alpha is 10 over 2. So if you come to the T distribution tables, you don't go to probably to you, you scroll down to the T distribution tables like this. And probability is not 0, 0,1 if they say 90%. Because if probability is 10%, you say alpha over 2. You say 10% over 2. So you come to 20% under 0, 0,05. You divide that probability by 2. You now understand. In the tables, always pro divide the probabilities by 2. What do I mean by probabilities? If they say 95% confidence interval, the probability is 5%, divide it by 2. So that when you come to the tables, you now know which one to take? These are alpha over two, All right? Assume that monthly returns are normally distributed with a mean 1% and a standard deviation of 4%. The population standard deviation is unknown because they are saying this is a sample standard deviation, meaning if, sample is, if the sample standard deviation is given, it means population standard deviation is not known. Construct a 95% confidence interval if the sample size is 24. Now notice, construct a 95% confidence interval if the sample size is 24. So you come here and say 2. Uh, remember, there are points where we have written and we considered them as laws. And we say if a sample size is small, we said if, if sample size is small and population variance is unknown, we said we use T distribution. We use T distribution. And what is the reliability factor? So you, 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 we, we go to T distribution at 95% confidence interval. So it's T distribution. Sample size is 24, so degrees of freedom are 23. If the sample size is 24 here, it means degrees of freedom are 23. So you say T23, uh, 95 uh, T23, then at, if, 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 if it's 95% confidence interval, it means alpha is 5%, so you divide 5% by 2 to get 0, 0,025. Then you get what the reliability factor becomes. Uh, you come to the tables. 23, 0, 0,025, which is the third, third line here. 23, 0, 0,025. 23, 0, 0,025. Yeah, 23, 0, 0,025. It's 2,0687. 2,0687. So I come here and I put 2,0687. This is the reliability factor, 2,0687. And then confidence interval, I calculate it as follows. A confidence interval, remember, it's calculated as simple mean plus or minus reliability factor. So I only go to tables to get reliability factor. In this case, sample mean is, in the question, sample mean is 1%, standard deviation is 4, sample size is 23. So it will be like 1 plus or minus standard deviation 4 over, uh, I mean, reliability factor first, 2,0687. Four, the standard deviation over 
square root of 23, which is 23 to the power 0, 0,5. Now I solve the, fra the function to the right, which is 2,0687 times 4 divided by 23 to the power for 0, 0,5 equals, is that so? 2,0687 times 4 equals divided by uh, 0, 0.687 times 4 equals uh, divided by open bracket 23 to the power 0, 0.5 um, equals okay okay I was supposed to 23 to the power 0, 0,5 divided by 23 to the power uh, 0, 0,5 equals I'm getting 1,73 so it, it will be like this 1 plus or minus 1,73 simple as that so the upper end of my confidence interval becomes 2,73. The upper end is 2, because I'm adding 1 plus. So the upper end is 2,73. The lower end becomes 1 minus 2, so the, the lower end becomes this minus 1, 0, 0,73. So it's minus 0, 0,732. Are you getting it? So this is the confidence interval which they want me to construct. And these figures are percentages. So that's the confidence interval. And the figures we are given, they are percentages. Well, well I said over square root of 23, it should be square root of 24. Sorry, sorry for that. Because N is 24. 23 is just used for calculating degrees of freedom. So let me repeat it. It's 2, it's 2, 0, 6, 8, 7 times 4 equals this divided by 24 to the power 0, 0,5 equals this. It's 1,69. Instead of 1,73, it's 1,69 here. 6,9. So here it becomes 2,69 becomes my upper end. My lower end becomes zero minus zero comma six nine. So there you go. That's that's how you calculate the confidence interval which they want us to calculate in this particular. Yeah. Now another other questions may be what is the upper end of the interval? It's a matter of taking your number to the right. What is the lower end of the interval? It's a matter of taking the number to your left. Okay. Ten analysts have given the following fiscal year earnings forecast for a stock. So these are like number of analysts who forecasted 1,4, the frequency is 1, who forecasted 1,43, the frequency is 1, etc. Because the sample size is a small fraction of the number of analysts who follow this stock, assume that we can ignore the finite population correction factor. Uh, assume that the analyst forecasts are normally distributed. What are the mean forecast and standard deviation? So it's a matter of calculating the mean and calculating the standard deviation. So this is like basic statistics. Mean, we say sum of, you know, if the number is saying 1,44 and analysts were three, it means there were three analysts with this figure. So when you're calculating the mean, it's, it's a matter of knowing how we calculate it. So it's like any, yeah, and then we have got frequency. Frequency. Now our frequency we can refer to it as f. Earnings we can refer to it as as f x. I mean as x, and then x times f, which is f x then uh, you can you can find the mean that way 
Now, can you, it's a matter of coming up with the figures, 1,4443. So it's like, it's like in, in, except 4,9 and 4,6, except 4,9 and 4,6, but all other variables are there. So it's like 1,4, except 4,9 and 4,6. So it will be like this. Oh, no. It's 1, comma. It's one comma four four three four four one comma four three comma four four one comma four five one comma four eight four seven four eight and one comma five one comma four se four seven one comma four eight one comma five this is what you must be doing at the end of every lecture to use the not to try to use the notes one one three two one 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 three two one one and then fx is a matter of multiplying this times frequency so if you multiply this by frequency, you get this, and then you 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 tally them up like that. So the total the total here yes, sum of fx you are getting sum as 14,5, and the sum of this again, sum of the analysts which were available is 10. So what is the mean? Because the question says calculate the mean so you simply say mean equals mean, mean is 10, of course equals 14,5 divided by 10 and we get 1,45 that's the mean because these are these are mean returns so the figure 1,45 is as a percentage the figure 1,45 is as a percentage Right, so that's the mean there, and then uh, the other the other question is then calculate the calculate the the standard deviation. It was calculate the mean and the standard deviation. Now, when you want to calculate the standard deviation, it's a matter of subtracting the it's it's a matter of subtracting the mean. Every element here subtract the mean. You square this. Every element subtract the mean. You square this and then you divide by. You divide by one a n minus one. In this case, it will be fourteen minus one. So let us square the mean on every element, which we say x minus mean. X minus mean. You have to find x minus mean. You square everything and then you divide by x minus mean. Um, you know, you need to read this carefully. When if if you if you are given 144, it means there were three one four one comma four fours. It's it wasn't one. There were actually three one comma four fours. That's what it means. So if we were to list, you would were to say one comma four four, one comma four four, one comma four four. So if you are saying x minus mean, remember to multiply by n because there were actually three one comma four fours. So it 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 was like this. X mi minus mean like this. We square it. We square it. But remember. We squared, but remember how many one comma four fours were they? They were three. They were three. So you then have to multiply what you have here by f. To to multiply by f acknowledges the fact that one comma four five were two numbers. So it's the first one comma four five, another one comma four five, or simply multiply by f. So it will be equal to you'll be saying f, which is your frequency times open bracket 
um, open bracket x minus 1,45. That? Oh, I have to square it. This one should be squared. Should be squared like this. And I drag it. And again, I add it. 0, 0, 0, 0,007. Because I want to find standard, I want to find variance. I then say var. You know, variance, remember, it's sum of. It's sum, I, I wrote the formula later. Sum of earlier. Sum of f. It's now f bracket x minus mean and and then you divide this by n minus 1 n minus you divide this by n minus 1 now n is the total frequency so it will be equal to it will be equal to it will be equal to, I now have the figures, 0, 0,007 over, my n was 10, so it's over 9. 0, 0,007 over 9, and what do I get? If I say 0, 0,007 over 9 equals, equals this over 9. So that's the variance. I'm getting that funny, funny figure there. You can... Because these are percentages, I can as well. Right. So, so there you go. Now, the question said, calculate. Uh, the question said, calculate standard deviation, meaning standard deviation. So, SD standard deviation equals variance to the power. 0, 0,5, which is equals to, so I'm saying equals this to the power 0, 0,5. So variance is 0, 0,2. It's actually 0, 0,3. We can put it because these are percentages. Okay, so there you go. All right. So the question now was, so we now have variance and standard deviation. Now the question now is the the other question then says provide a 95% confidence interval for the population mean and and for the population mean focus. Now 95% for the population. Are you not seeing that population variance is not known? Why is population variance not known? It's because we used a sample. 10 analysts, so 10 analysts is not a population. 10 analysts is a sample. And there we are also we are also told that because the sample is a small fraction of the number of analysts, so these were just 10 analysts. So if you want now to find 95% confidence interval, you again you again use t distribution. T distribution. So it's t9. So you, you have a reliability factor, reliability factor, uh, you say T9 uh, and alpha, it's 95% confidence interval. So alpha is, I said it's 95, alpha is 5%, so you divide by 0, 0, by 2, you, you become 0, 0, 0.025. So you go to the table and find the liability factor of T9, 0, 0,025. T9, 0, 0,025. Yeah. 0, 0, 0, 2, 2,2622. So the liability factor is 2,2622. There you go. And then you proceed to, to estimate confidence interval. You now know that confidence interval, if I bring the formula again, I, I'm, I'm bringing it over and over until it makes sense. Now, confidence interval, you get it like this. So the mean is 1,45, and the you say plus or minus 
reliability factor 2 comma 2 6 2 2 2 comma 2 6 2 2 times standard deviation we we, we obtained the standard deviation is 0 comma 3 0 comma 0 3 over square root of 10 10 to the power 0 comma 5 so you again find the the confidence interval like the way we have done it before so it will be as simple as that as simple as that you remember this you are the, you solve the the function to the right and you subtract it to get the lower end you add it to get the upper end simple as that uh, we are now on question number all right 13 analysts so again this is similar uh, can you can you try to answer for me question number eight I'm just giving you five min five minutes. Are you there, Munash? Yes, I'm there. Yes. Can you try answering for me question number eight? Notice you can take can you take a screenshot of how I have calculated mean and standard deviation here? Just get a screenshot. Okay, you come to your Skype and, and click more like this. Take a snapshot. So let me first show you the screenshot. Can you take a snapshot? Okay. Um. Yeah, I took a snapshot. Okay, perfect. So follow the same, the same table, yet the same table in the interest of your calculations to get the mean Forecast and standard deviation of forecasts. The main focus, okay. But then I can't access the the screenshot in the deeper E. Ah, you can access it. Are you using the phone? No, I'm using an iPad. How do you access it? Yes, it allows you to multitask. You open it. Okay. Oh, do you have this book opened with you? Uh, no, I don't have the book opened. Let me let me check. Okay. Uh... Okay. Just five. Just four minutes. I'll be back.
Right, Munashi, are you winning or we do it together again here? Uh, I think I'm almost done. Yes, because it's a matter of seeing if the relevant figures there and we are done. Um, for the mean, I got 5.8. 5.8. Which I'm not sure if it's correct. Uh, well, it's, for the standard deviation, I got 19.04. You got what? <laughs> 90. 19, which I think is wrong. Yes, because you can see from the data here that they are, the data is ranging from 7, 0 0.7 to 0 0.8. So standard deviation is the deviation of variability of this data. Only, honestly, it's not varying by 19, as you can see. Even without calculating, you can tell it's, it's not even varying by more than one. Mm, yeah, that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> yes. So I like the part where you said, which I think I'm wrong. 0 0.7. So let me just redo. I'm just repeating the same table in the interest of, in the interest, I'm keying in the figures on the same table. 7, 2, 7, 4, 7, 5, 7, 6, 7, 2, 7, 4, 7, 5, 7, 6, 7, 7. So it's like 0, 0,7, 0, 0,7, 2, 0, 0,7, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0,75, 0,76, 0,77, and the last one, 0,82, 0,82, and then frequencies, it's 241, 2413111, 413111. All right. Notice it has already calculated itself the issues. So the mean becomes mean becomes sum of that 9,62 9,62 over 0,7 9,62 over 13, so the mean equals equals uh, 9,62 over 18. Your mean was what? I'm actually embarrassed to say it now. It, it was... <laughs> okay, it's okay. There's no need for you to be embarrassed. 9,6... Because the mean is the average of these earnings. And then... Uh, frequency. Now this was minus. So it it is minus zero comma. It's minus mean, which is minus zero comma seven four. Zero comma seven four. So if you drag this, oh, why is that? It appears I I changed the figures. Not change zero comma seven four. All right. Okay, so I drag it. All right, so there you go. So the it's zero it's it becomes the variance becomes 0, 0,12028, 0, 0,0128 over, this way 13 minus 1, that's over 12. 13 minus 1 is over 12. All right, so equals this. So this one equals 
that one over 12. Okay, so there you go. So standard deviation. So so when well, so you have that so variance is standard deviation is 0, 0,03. Actually, 0, 0,03 makes sense because we are saying what is the likely variance of these earnings? In what way are they varying from the mean? The mean is 0, 0,74. How are they varying from the mean on, 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 on a standard estimate basis? They are varying by 0, 0,03. So you can now use these figures to calculate, to estimate the confidence interval. And now the other question says, what aspect of the data makes us uncomfortable about using T tables to construct confidence intervals for the population mean forecast? In what way uh, they are saying, what really can cause us not to use T tables? Hello? Mm -hmm. Um if the sample size is big. Right? Ah not 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 necessarily. The sample size is not it's not big per se. You know, here you can see here that the mean the mean is 0, 0,74, and there is also earnings of 0, 0,74. So the mean is 0, 0,74, and there are earnings of 0, 0,74. So what it means is such data is called a bimodal data. It, 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 it's a bimodal data because it has got the mean, which is 0, 0,74, as well as the, you know, there is an outcome of 0, 0,74 and the mean of 0, 0,74. We call such data a bimodal data. It's not a normal data. It's a bimodal data. So because of that, we can't use T distribution because T distributions and Z tables are from data which is normal. Right. Uh, another another issue another issue that you would have said is, have you noticed that as we increase degrees of freedom? The T distribution appears to mirror the normal distribution. So degrees of freedom of, of they are now about, because this is 13, so degrees of freedom are about 12. So it, 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 the distribution itself converged to Z distribution away from T. So that is another aspect also. But the, the issue here is we have a data in which we have a variable of 0, 0,74 and a mod of 0, 0,74, I mean a mean of 0, 0,74, implying that this data is bimodal, it's not normal. It, does, it doesn't revolve around the mean. Now, can we, can we jump and just get to some multiple choice parts of it? I normally must multiple choice, they start somewhere here. Yes, number 17. And then we wrap it up, I'm sure. You know what? This exercise, I want, normally I would want you to do it immediately after the lecture. So whenever we end the lecture, I would be expecting you to leave your exam room around six to, to have at least two hours from the lecture to do questions on what we have been discussing. And then it, it makes sense. Now, multiple choice questions, normally they mirror what you are actually going to, to face. The best approach for creating a stratified sample of a population is you know, I said it, stratified sampling, it's when you first group, you first group your observations into non-overlapping groups, which are known as strata, and then you draw samples in each stratum. So what is the answer to question number 17? Uh, A. So they are saying the best. I, my mind is saying C somehow, and my mouth is saying A. Yes, C is the best. 
say he's the best. You don't draw equal. Ah, can, can you imagine? Can you imagine? It, the word equal is not ideal. I have mentioned that. Uh, I, uh, can you imagine a situation where we are in a class, there are only three girls and 24 boys. And then you want to perform stratified sampling. Honestly, you can't group girls on their own, boys on them, on themselves, and then draw equal sample. Is it possible? No. No, it's not possible. You then draw a relative size from each because you, the, you, you, you know, we, we, are, we are having a situation where we have got 10 girls and 15 boys. So the ratio is 40% as to 60%. 40% girls, 60% boys. So if you want now to come up with a sample of 20, from girls you draw 40% of 20, from boys you draw 60% of 20. Is it making sense? Yes, it is. Right. Then a, a population is a non-normal distribution with mean, mu, and variance. It's non-normal, like a binomial, like, like a, any other a binomial, bimodal, whatever. The sampling distribution of means is computed from samples of large sizes from that population. Remember, I told you the, the main importance of central limit theorem. The main importance of central limit theorem is that you as an analyst, you don't need to bother yourself about the distribution of the data from which you are drawing a sample. Whether it is from bimodal, it is from binomial, it is from Poisson, it is from log normal, it's no longer your baby because Central limit theorem says as large samples are drawn from this population, the distribution of sample means tend to be normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared over n. So what is the answer to question number 18? Mm, B. B is the answer. Mm -hmm. And then a variance, a sample mean is computed from a population with variance 2,5. Remember, this is a variance. Mm -hmm. The sample size is 40. What is the standard error of the sample mean? Can you try to calculate that? Remember, the standard error of the sample mean is variance over square root of n. Variance over square root of n. I mean, it's a standard deviation over square root of n. Standard deviation over square root of n. Um, zero point three eight seven four. You said what over what? I said um, two point four five divided by square root of forty. No, that one, you said variance over square root of n. It's a standard deviation over square root of n. Uh, so, 2,45 is not standard deviation, it's variance. Okay. Um, I got B, 0 0.247. Okay, good. An estimator with expected value equal to the parameter is, that, is, that it is intended to estimate is described as what? Uh, consistent, C. No. An estimator with an expected value equal to the parameter that is. It's unbiased. Uh, I, I, let me define this, these terms for you again. An estimator is unbiased if it is equal to the parameter that it is estimating. Then an estimator is consistent if by increasing the sample size, it converges towards the parameter it is estimating. <laughs> you get that? 
the probability, the probability of the estimator being equal to the parameter increases as you increase the sample size. That is called consistent. Efficient is when there is no other parameter which is different from what we have got. I mean, consistent is when there is no other, I mean, efficient is when there is no other estimate apart from what we have got. Right. An estimate, ah, okay, an estimator is consistent. If an estimator is consistent, an increase in sample size will increase. The accuracy of estimates. Yes, it will increase the accuracy of the estimates. Good. For a wider two-sided confidence interval, an increase in degrees of, of, of confidence will result in and for, you know what? These are now the normally the exam questions. They are of this nature. You agree with me. They don't normally allow you even to do all that we are doing at the top. They will be like this. And the examiner knows that if you are able to work, to perform workings, you can answer this. And you realize that the width of the interval is affected by what is called reliability factor. It is affected by a reliability factor. And I said the higher the probability, the higher the reliability factor. The lower the probability, the lower the reliability factor. And if reliability factor is lower, width is lower. If reliability is higher, the width is higher. So what is the answer to question number 22? Uh it's a it's a good all right as t distribution degrees of freedom decrease the t distribution most likely that will be tower i i said it just now that that part of the question I know that it's not a B. Yes. You know, you know, the issue is the lower the degrees of freedom, the flatter the T distribution. But the higher the degrees of freedom, the T distribution converges and becomes normal. Mm -hmm. So the answer is A. If you decrease the degrees of freedom, you are making it flatter, move away from the normal. Are, are you not seeing here? For a sample size of 17, mean of 116,3 and variance of 245,55, the width of 90% confidence interval using T distribution is closest to, two. you know. So it's a matter, of, you know, if sample size is 17, it means degrees of freedom are 16. And 90% confidence interval, it means alpha is 10. So alpha over 2 is 0 0.05. So you come to T tables. It's 16, 0 0.05, which is 1,75. This, that you, that's your reliability factor. And then you, you compute confidence interval in the, using the formula that we have been using. But the question is just saying width. So width. You notice how we calculate with, we say reliability factor times the standard error of the estimate multiplied by two. Like what we did on the, on the first, um, on the second question when we, they were talking about the width, you multiply standard error, reliability factor times standard error of estimate multiplied by two. Uh, well, uh, if, if I can ask for this question uh, for you to, Try doing it. You know, it's 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 it's, it's important. Uh, I I will not leave you doing it. You do it whilst we are discussing. He's saying for a sample size of 65, in it, in which case it's greater than 30. So we use the Z tables. For a sample size of 65 with mean 31, normally distributed with a population variance of 529, the 99% confidence interval is closest to. Two. Or let me do it again. It's a 99% confidence interval. You you pick, you again pick this formula. 
similar to if to use. So this is the, how you calculate confidence interval. You say mean, because here we use Z, population size is large. So mean is 31, 31 plus or minus, standard deviation is square root of 529, 529. So standard deviation is 23 over. Uh, they are saying sample size is 65, 23 over square root of 65, uh, 23 over 65 to the power 0, 0,5. And then you remember to multiply by the reliability factor. Reli reliability factor at 95% confidence interval is 1,96. We have, we have them at the top here. We, ca we calculated them. 1,96 from tables. So multiply by... Okay, so you come here and multiply by 1,96. This is, you know what? This has been my secret. I do all questions at my disposal. I will never enter an exam with a question that I haven't attempted. It's, it's, it's not my nature. So if I can, if you can just have every day a reading, you know, there are just a few readings. They are around 65 or so. If you can only have every day a reading and its entire question, even without doing any practice, believe you me, you will actually get your, your, your you, you come up with a pass mark. The reason is the questions they repeat each other. Are you noticing we are busy doing normal distributions, which we discussed in the last, in the previous topic? So it's 23 times 1,96 times, I mean, divided by 65 to the power 0, 0,5 equals. Okay, so I'm getting 5,59. So the, it, it, what I get here is 5,59. I check what that the question wants. The question says, well, it says 99% confidence interval, not 95 so my reliability factor, I took the one for 95. I was supposed to pick the one for 99. The one for 99 is using Z, not using T, is 2,58. So I was supposed to use 2,58 here. 2,58, or S is my reliability factor here. 2,58. Okay, so not 1,56, but 2,558. 2,58 equals, right, 7,36. So I get 7,36, and I come to the question. The question is saying, the lower limit of the interval is, now they want the lower limit, not the interval, not the width. Remember, it's 31 plus or minus. So it's 31 plus or minus. So it will be 31 minus 7, 36. So it's minus 31. So the lower limit is 23,63. So it will be made of coming here and get 23,639. So it's 23,64. And your answer becomes A. An increase in sample size is likely to, to result in what will happen if you increase sample size. Um, decrease in the standard error of sample mean. Yes, standard error of the sample mean decreases because standard error of the sample mean, we say standard deviation over square root of sample size. So if a sample size decreases, increases, it means the denominator increases and the standard error of the sample mean decreases. Right, number 27, a, uh, a report on long-term stock returns focused exclusively on all currently public, publicly traded firms in an industry is most likely susceptible to, they, they are carrying out a research which is based on firms which are available. Uh, 
I think survivorship bias. Yes, that's survivorship bias. You are ignoring fames which you have since made the others which have since changed the industry, others which have since ceased the operations. Right? And then which sampling bias is most likely investigated with out of range sample test? Out of range sample test. Uh Or it, it, we call it out of sample test. Sorry, I'm using my own words there. Uh, I think data mining bias. Yes, data mining bias. Because I said data mining bias. It's when data was was gathered for a particular purpose in mind, and then you use that same data for your own research. You may be mining from a wrong mine. You may be using data which is not in. You be you be using data which might not be have been gathered for that particular purpose. Uh, you know what? Uh, I I understand. I understand. This is now. This is now what we must be doing. You know what? If we do it this way, there's also benefit in that. Come revision, we, we will not be even doing this. We will be done with this, isn't it so? Yes. Yes. Uh, do you prefer this? I actually prefer this. Right. You know what? If you prefer this, you would notice it might even be possible to just, uh, but it's not possible to just start by doing questions because if I explain first, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be having the same language. I feel. I'm sure explaining first makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Makes a great deal of sense. So you, because you know, on the reliability factor, <laughs> Look, we are now employing using the terms that we were using in the lecture. We, if we are if we are to be consistent with the reliability factors, if you ask me which set of questions say are better placed to prepare me for the exam, I, I can guarantee you the curriculum questions. The curriculum questions have, have, have a higher ranking in terms of reliability factor than, than other questions. The curriculum questions, but you know, as students, we tend to downplay them because they are set immediately after this, after the reading. So it will be like they are easy because you are doing them immediately after having a reading. Whereas the practice questions may be set independent of any reading. So in that case, they be, they they tend to have more examinative effect, but less reliable. You tend you you get that these are more reliable but they don't have more examinative effect because you do them immediately after doing the reading. So they may appear to be very easy and clumsy. Whereas if you are, if you are doing questions from a practice, practice booklet, you don't have any reading. You just start by doing questions. So they tend to be of examinative effect, but believe me, they are less reliable. These ones, are more level. So when you are practicing, do these, do questions, do these, do questions, do these, do questions until you get to the end. Um, there is hypothesis testing. You know, the time we've taken doing questions, I pref I wanted to do this. Uh, but in any case, it, it, it's again easy. It's a matter of, of, of letting you know how we perform hypothesis test. What are the circumstances or steps involved? How, how, how do we say we have a two-tailed test like this one? It's called a two-tailed test. How do we say we have a one-tailed test like that one? It's a one-tailed test. So if it's a two-tailed test, you divide alpha by two, meaning the probability that you are given, or like this. Alpha is 5%. So two-tailed test, you, you know, the probability of rejecting the now hypothesis when it is correct, it's called alpha or significance level. The probability of rejecting a correct now hypothesis, it, it, that's the probability, that's the significance level we are talking about, the type one error. For, for two-tailed test, alpha you divide by two. For one-tailed test, alpha you don't divide by two. That's what I wanted to discuss. I'm, I'm, I don't say I'm discussing it, I'm not. I'm not, these are two, these are technical stuff that I'm saying. And then, and then notice the standard error of the estimate is, is still used. So I will have a rundown of this. 
I need to have a rundown of this. When, 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 when? You know, uh, in most instances, because it's month end, I won't be warm. You know, month end is difficult because I'll be doing month end procedures. I do quite a lot of things, Nash. So I'll be in town. Like today, I had to rush down from town because I realized my my town internet is modem. It's my fi. It's not it's not conducive for and tail one also for in my other office we use tail one but if i get to my other office i realized i would there would there be a lot of things which need me there that would uh, equally cause me not to dash down home for the lecture so because of that i had to say let me dash home for the lecture with Minaj. otherwise she may be cross with me so 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 here here, here we have let us preserve this Conservatively, I will not fire you Tuesday afternoon. I will not fire you on Tuesday afternoon because it will be on the 4th of of May. Perhaps I might have done, I might be done with my month end issues. I will, I will let you know in the morning of the Tuesday, 4th of May. Is that so, Mnash? Yes, that's fine. Okay, cool. So promise me, Mnash, I have just promised me this. You are reading and practicing. We, we have changed the mode. We changed it today. If we're not doing it, it's not it's not your it's not your fault because we had not discussed about it. Now let us do it this way. Everything we are doing, even if it seems easy, even if a reading seems easy, you there's nothing that you lose by doing questions. Just to try to do some few questions there and see how it goes. Cheers. You have a wonderful uh, week ahead and you have a good evening and night. Bye. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome.